Another populist falls, Brazil ditches Bolsonaro and takes a turn for the left. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff and this is Plain English Lesson Number 522 on Monday, November 14th, 2022. JR is the producer and he has uploaded this full lesson to plainenglish.com slash 522. Coming up today, Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, popularly known as Lula, defeated incumbent Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro in a closely watched election in Latin America's biggest economy. If you're not from Brazil, I'll give you everything you need to know about the election in the biggest country in Latin America. If you are from Brazil, I hope you find this to be a fair summary of what happened. I know passions run high on things like this. In the second half of the lesson, we'll talk about the English expression on a technicality, and we have an election-themed quote of the week, which involves breakfast cereal. Stay tuned for that. Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva was president of Brazil for two terms from 2003 to 2010. When he was first elected, many wondered whether he would steer Brazil radically to the left. He was a former union organizer with a penchant for wearing Che Guevara t-shirts. In government, however, his policies, while definitely left of center, were much more moderate than many in the business community had feared. Lula benefited from a boom in commodity prices, and he used the proceeds to expand the size of the state. To his credit, he instituted a cash transfer program that brought many people out of poverty. Then, things fell apart after he left office. His successor was Dilma Rousseff, an economist who had been Lula's chief of staff. While she was president, an investigation revealed high levels of corruption among government, big private businesses, and state-owned companies. The scandal touched almost all levels of government, going back many years and even reached 11 other countries. Dilma Rousseff was impeached and removed from office. Lula, the former president, was convicted of money laundering and corruption, and he was sentenced to nine years in prison. Jair Bolsonaro is a former army captain and was a backbench legislator from the state of Sao Paulo. In 2018, he won the presidency on a wave of frustration over corruption and a general sense that all of society was rigged against the average voter. He promised to tackle corruption, jumpstart the economy, and get crime under control. His presidency had some successes. In his first year, his proposed constitutional reform of public pensions passed. It was a significant victory. He also presided over a partial privatization of the state electricity company. But these accomplishments were overshadowed by other controversies. During his time as president, deforestation in the Amazon accelerated as his rancher supporters 
encroached on what should have been protected forest land. He dismissed COVID-19 as a minor illness, and he undermined the effort to vaccinate the population. His foreign policy was incoherent. He felt a personal affinity with Donald Trump and signed on to many Trump-led causes. In a case of unfortunate timing, he visited Russia right before the invasion of Ukraine. And he let Brazil's more important relationships in Latin America wither. What's more, his own family was under constant investigation for corruption themselves. A recent newspaper report showed that Bolsonaro family and friends had bought 51 properties in cash without explaining how they, as public servants, paid for it all. So that was the backdrop of the 2022 election in Latin America's biggest country. The country was deeply divided. The campaign was nasty. Bolsonaro had the support of socially conservative voters, evangelical Christians, farmers, ranchers, and gun owners. However, he had lost the support of business-focused voters turned off by the multiple controversies of his presidency. He squared off against Lula, who had been president during much better times. But the deep corruption exposed during car wash didn't start the day Lula left office. Lula's conviction for corruption was overturned after he served 18 months in jail. That's why he could run again. Lula maintains his innocence, but his conviction wasn't overturned because he was found innocent. It was overturned on a technicality. Still, he was able to remind voters that their lives were better when he was in office. Brazilians deserved a better choice, but this was the choice they got. Initial polls showed Lula with a double-digit lead over Bolsonaro, but those polls proved to underestimate the incumbent president's support. In the first round of voting on October 2nd, Lula won 48.4% of the vote to Bolsonaro's 43.2%. This was much closer than polls had predicted. Since neither reached 50%, they went to the second round on October 28th. In that head-to-head vote, Lula won by a razor-thin margin, gaining 50.9% to Bolsonaro's 49.1%. It was the closest election result since Brazil's return to democracy in 1985. It was also the first time an incumbent president lost a bid for re-election. Prior to the vote, Bolsonaro had said that the only way he could lose is if his opponents committed election fraud. Many worried he was laying the groundwork to contest the election results and hold on to power. However, after the results were released on election night, All of Brazil's institutions, including many Bolsonaro allies, lined up to acknowledge Lula's win. 
Bolsonaro waited two days to speak. In his first comments, he did not concede or congratulate his opponent, but neither did he offer any resistance to the election results. Instead, he focused on his own party's gains in Congress. His chief of staff acknowledged the inevitable, that Bolsonaro's government would work with Lula's team to ensure a smooth transition on January 1st. Congratulations to Lula. However, he will find that his third term will be quite different from his first two. For one thing, he won both his previous terms with over 60% support and he had strong majorities in Congress. This time, he won just over 50% in the presidential vote. He will have a narrower majority in Congress, and the country is deeply divided. He acknowledged that in a speech after his victory, saying he was half happy and half worried. Second, Lula won't have waves of commodity cash to spend like last time. And third, he needs to win back trust and show that the corruption of car wash won't come back in his third term. If you want to travel back in time a little, you can listen to Lesson 100, which we did when Bolsonaro came to power. And in Lesson 34, we talked about that car wash scandal and a related Netflix series. The Netflix series is good. You can still watch it. And there's even a second season. Today's English expression is on a technicality. A technicality is a small detail in the law or a set of rules. It's usually procedural, so a technicality is usually not considered central to an argument or a procedure. This is most often used in the law but you can also use it anytime there are a lot of detailed rules in place. So let's start with the law. The law in many places is full of rules that protect people who are accused. Often, that means that people who commit crimes and who probably might be proven guilty are instead set free on a technicality. They are set free because the correct procedure wasn't followed somewhere, because of a small rule violation, because of something that's not really about guilt or innocence, but is still important. So imagine someone robs a house and runs away with a bag full of jewelry and puts it all in the trunk of his car. And imagine he later gets pulled over by police for running a stop sign. Now the police officer, out of curiosity, asks him to open the trunk. The officer finds the bag full of jewelry arrests the criminal, and the jewelry is returned to its rightful owner. Case closed, right? Not in the U.S. In the U.S., a police officer needs probable cause to search private property. A police officer can't search a car out of curiosity. She needs a reason to search the car. And in this case, the police officer had no probable cause. She had no good reason to search the trunk. 
So the search was illegal. If the search was illegal, and if the bag of jewelry is the only evidence in the case, then the criminal will be released on a technicality. Listen, he did it. He's guilty. He had the bag of stolen jewelry in the trunk of his car. Maybe he had gloves and a ski mask in the front seat. It's a hundred percent certain that he's guilty. But the rules are the rules, and the law is the law. The police officer didn't have probable cause to search the trunk, and therefore the criminal gets off on a technicality. Years ago, a popular candidate for mayor of Chicago was almost prevented from running for office on a technicality. Ram Emanuel is his name, and he did become mayor. But before he was mayor, he worked in Washington, D.C. as Barack Obama's chief of staff. He left that job to run for mayor of Chicago. He filed all the paperwork. He gathered all the signatures he needed. He followed all the rules. But then someone said, hey, the law says that you have to be a resident of Chicago to run for mayor. Maybe you, Ram, lived in Chicago before, but you've been living in Washington, D.C. for the last couple of years. So some of his opponents tried to get him excluded on a technicality. He owned a home in Chicago, but he spent most of his time outside of the city in the two years prior. So he did everything right. The substance of his candidacy was fine, filed all the paperwork, got the signatures, followed all the main rules, but one small detail, one small procedural thing didn't seem right. In the end, the elections board did allow him to run, but his opponents tried to get him excluded on a technicality. Voting in the United States is administered at the state level, even for federal elections. So every state has different voting procedures. It's becoming more common now to vote by mail. However, there's a problem. It's possible for your mail-in ballot to be excluded on a technicality. That means it's possible for your ballot to be excluded for a procedural or a small detail. For example... You could be eligible to vote, you could fill in the ballot correctly, and you can send it in on time. But if you don't sign the bottom of the ballot, your vote is excluded on a technicality. Again, this is a small detail that's typically on the margins of the main question. You were eligible to vote. You filled out the form, sent it in, but you did one small procedural thing wrong. But rules are rules, and your ballot can be excluded on a technicality. So that brings us to the president-elect of Brazil, Lula. He was convicted of money laundering and corruption in the car wash scandal, and he spent 18 months in jail. Now, his conviction was later overturned by the Supreme Court, and he was released from jail. So that means he wasn't guilty of corruption and money laundering? Well, I'm not here to say whether he is 
or is not guilty of that. But his conviction was overturned on a technicality. He was released from jail because his trial took place in the wrong court. Not because of the evidence, not because of the witnesses, not because of flawed judgment, not because new information came to light, not for any substantive reason. The Supreme Court said he should have been tried in a federal court in Brasilia, not in the court in the south of Brazil where he was convicted. So the Supreme Court did not say if he was guilty or not guilty. They only said his first trial took place in the wrong court, so it was overturned. It was overturned and Lula got out of jail, and that is a technicality. Maybe the court in Brasilia would have come to a different conclusion. We don't know, and we'll never know. Election season is over in Brazil. It's over in the United States. The U.S. had midterm elections to Congress. And in both places, there were a lot of television commercials for candidates. But I want you to imagine something. Imagine a time when there were no television commercials for candidates. The first television commercials for a president in the United States came in 1952. Dwight Eisenhower ran them. His opponent was Adelaide Stevenson, who thought TV commercials for political candidates shouldn't be allowed. And so here's a quote from Adelaide Stevenson back in 1952 when he was worried about TV commercials for politicians. He said, The idea that you can merchandise candidates for high office like breakfast cereal is the ultimate indignity to the democratic process. Yeah, probably not too far off the mark. Actually, breakfast cereal commercials are probably more truthful and informative, right? Well, that brings us to the end of today's Plain English lesson number 522. Remember that the full lesson is available at plainenglish.com 522. And this week, that includes the step-by-step -step video walkthrough where I show you exactly how to use the word neither as the subject of a sentence. And that's at plainenglish.com 522. We'll be back on Thursday to talk about Netflix's new popular series on the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. The show is one of the most popular on the platform, but it's also being criticized from multiple angles. So that's Thursday. See you then. <laughs>